All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about merchandising business and the multi-step income statement. As we move into chapter six, things take a little bit of a turn in the road, if you will. Our accounting cycle is going to be exactly the same as before. Journal entries to the ledger, ledger to an unadjusted trial balance, then our adjustments. Once we record the adjustments to the ledger, adjusted trial balance, financial statements, and so on, right? Nothing changes with regard to the cycle. What does change is the things we have to account for. So, Chapter 6 focuses almost solely on teaching how to do entries for a merchandising business. So we're going to have a merchandising business here. And I'm going to start off by saying that we are going to sell tires. Does that look like a tire? Okay, we're going to sell tires. The only reason I pick tires is because it's a simple example that hopefully will make sense as we go through these transactions. So we're going to do some journal entries. I'm not going to make official journal here to put these in, but uh, we're going to just kind of record them as we go. And hopefully it will uh, you'll be able to track with me and it will make sense. So first thing we have to do if we're going to sell tires is buy some tires. And so we're going to spend some money. We're going to buy 30 tires. And they cost 50 bucks a piece. And so that's going to be $1,500. Okay. Now how do I record this purchase? I'm going to debit my inventory account. That's my asset account for $1,500. Inventory is the account we use to record the cost of the products that we intend to sell as our business operation. In this case, since we paid the $1,500 cash, is going to be credited for $1,500. Okay, so that is for a simple purchase of merchandise for cash. Now, what's our ultimate goal here? Our ultimate goal is then to turn around and sell Okay, these items. So we are going to sell, uh, let's say, 10 of these. And we're not going to sell them for, 10, for 50 because that's what we paid for them, right? We want to sell them for more than that because we want to make some money. So we're going to sell them for 70 okay, which would be a sale of $700. And let's assume the customer pays us in cash. So what do we do? We're going to debit cash for 700 and we're going to credit sales revenue for 700 That's to record the sale of these tires to our customer. We've charged them 700 they paid us 700 we've earned the revenue because a sale has taken place. But... That's not the only thing that happens, right? Now that we've sold these 10 tires, we no longer have them. They should no longer be represented in our inventory. So what do we do? Well, we're going to take them out of our inventory. So we're going to credit inventory for how much? Well, those tires we sold for 10 cost us 50 and so we're going to take out $500 from our inventory account. Then what do we debit for $500? Well, any time that we use up an asset, use up the benefits of an asset, we expense its cost. When we use up supplies, we record supplies expense. When we use up prepaid rent, we would record rent expense. Even when we use up the benefits of equipment or buildings, right, we record depreciation expense. And so here with inventory, as we use up the benefits, which 
The benefits are bringing us revenues. We use up the benefits of the inventory. We need to record an expense for the cost of the inventory. Now you might say, all right, well, let's record inventory expense. And that would make sense. But that's not the account we use. We use an account called cost of goods sold. So I like to abbreviate that with C-O-G-S because it's easier to, than writing it all out. But cost of goods sold is an expense account, even though it doesn't say expense in the name. It's one of the only ones that doesn't say expense in the name. But it is an expense account. It is the expense account associated with our inventory. And so that is how we would record the sale of these tires for cash. And that right there, these two sets of entries, the white and the blue, are the very basics of merchandising, business, accounting, in terms of sales. But merchandising business has become quite more complex, okay? Because many different things can happen. So let's look at another scenario. We're gonna stick with our tire company. Okay, I'm just going to try to block off some of this so we can kind of separate stuff. Let's say that we go and we purchase some more tires. We're going to purchase 20 tires. They still cost us 50 bucks. And so we have a total of a thousand dollar purchase. But this time we're going to pay for them later. What do we do? We're going to record a debit to inventory for a thousand because we, have, we now have two, 20 more tires that have a cost of a thousand. And then we're going to credit accounts payable, right? Because we haven't paid for them yet. This might be the case if we ordered the tires and then they were shipped to us along with a bill or an invoice. We have to pay for them. So that's a credit sale, okay? That's what we call a credit, or credit purchase, I should say. Purchase on account. But then what do we do when we pay for them? Well, when it comes time to pay, we would debit accounts payable for a thousand and credit cash for a thousand right and that would be the simple purchasing of inventory on account and then paying for it okay now if this was the case we now have how many tires okay we started with 30 tires uh, let me just do some calculations way over here we started with 30 tires and we sold 10, which left us with 20. Now we just bought 20 more. So now we have 40 tires. Okay, just trying to keep track of the inventory, right? How many of these things do we have? So moving forward, what happens if we make a sale, or sorry, we make a purchase. We'll say it's a purchase first, then we'll look at sales. We make a purchase of inventory and we buy 15 more tires. So we're going to buy 15 more tires, $50 a piece. So there we're looking at $750, okay? What do we do? We purchase. Here's my debit. I'm going to debit inventory for $750. Haven't paid for them yet, so accounts payable, $750. I buy these tires, these additional 15 tires. Um, and then I realize, oh, well, two of these tires... Uh, have some defects in them so number one I don't want them and number two I certainly don't want to pay for them so what do I do well I return them right and if I return those two tires what is the dollar value that I'm looking at those two tires cost me 50 bucks so I'm looking at a hundred dollar return now, I haven't paid for them yet, right? So I'm not going to get any money back. But my accounting needs to change, right? If I return two of these tires that are supposed to cost me $100, I don't have to pay for them. And so the amount I owe other people in terms of accounts payable is going to go down by 100 bucks. And if I return two of these tires to the manufacturer, 
I no longer have those tires. So that $100 also needs to come out of my inventory. Okay, and so this here, let me, now before I do that, this here, this entry that we just made, the second part, is what is called a purchase return. Because I am returning something that I purchased, right? It's a purchase return. Now, I still have to pay for the remaining ones that I that I purchased, right? So if I started with 15 and I returned two, that means I still have 13 tires to pay for. And how much do I owe? Okay, in this scenario, I originally owed 750. But returning two of them took $100 off. And so what do I do next? Well, then I make my payment. My accounts payable is going to go away. Now, it started out at $750. I took away $100, which means there's $650 left. That's going to go away. And I'm going to pay my supplier $650 for the remaining tires that I kept. Okay. And so this is a scenario, and let me just try to do this here. This is a scenario that complicates things, right? When we sell stuff and purchase stuff, okay, things can be returned. If we're talking about merchandise, merchandise can be returned. It can be returned uh, by our customers. It can be returned by us. And so in this case, we are looking at stuff we purchased, came to our business, we looked at it at the tire shop, said these aren't defective, I don't want them, I'm sending them back. When I send them back, right, that's going to change my accounting. And when I send them back, I want to make sure I don't end up paying for them. So purchase returns are something that merchandising businesses have to deal with. Now, where are we at in terms of tires? We, we had 40 before we did all this stuff. We added 15 more tires, so that put us at 55 tires, right? And then we sent two back. So now we have 53 tires, right? 53 tires. So again, our goal with as a merchandising business is to sell our tires, right? That is our goal. And so let's let's make another sale. Let's say that we sell uh, 15 tires. Okay, I'm doing sales in blue and purchases in white, and that way we can kind of keep them separated. We sell 15 tires for 70 bucks a piece. Okay, that's a thousand and fifty dollars. Well, what do I record this as? Well, let's say that my customers have agreed to pay us later. We are shipping these tires to a customer. We are going to bill them. So we've sent them. We are billing them. What do we record? What's going to increase here? Our accounts receivable. The amount our customers owe us is going to go up by 1050 And we get to record this as sales revenue because we have earned this money because we have completed our obligation to the customer and have engaged in a sale. And so the tires are gone, we sent the bill, we've earned 1050 bucks. But now we no longer have those 15 tires. So what do we need to do for that? Those 15 tires that we paid 50 bucks for cost us $750 total. They are no longer in our possession. So we need to take those tires out of our inventory account. And since they are gone and we have experienced the benefits of them and used them up, we are going to expense that $750 through our cost of goods sold account. So anytime we make a sale here, recording these sales, we are recording an update to our inventory as well. 
Now, there are other ways to do this. This is what is called perpetual inventory, meaning we always record the changes in our inventory. Sometimes we do what's called periodic inventory, where we only record the changes in our inventory periodically, not every time they change. Most businesses today use perpetual inventory. We record changes in our inventory as they happen. So that's what we're doing here. Now, that's our sale. Now what happens, okay, what happens if our customers then turn around and say, oh, well, we don't want five of these tires. And they send them back to us. What do we do? The next thing we will do, if that's the case, we have five tires that we sold for $70. Let me get the math right here. We have five tires that we sold for $70, which is $350 total. Those five tires cost us 50 bucks, so that's $250 total. Now, what do we do with these numbers? Let's deal with the sale first. If our customers who have not paid us yet, right, we have accounts receivable, if our customers return items to us, what do we do? Well, if they return items we were charging them $350 for, then we are going to take that $350 out of accounts receivable because we are not going to get it, right? They are not going to pay us that money. Since they're not going to pay us that money, we are also going to take it out of our sales revenue. Okay. Now, there are other ways to do this, but this is the way that we are looking at according to your textbook. So, we take out the 350 from accounts receivable and sales revenue. Okay. Secondly, if they're returning these tires to us and there's nothing wrong with them, then we have to put those tires back into our inventory. Okay? So we're going to debit inventory for these five tires that are coming back. We are going to debit inventory for the amount these, these tires originally cost us, which is 250 Okay? We're not going to debit inventory for what we were charging the customer. That is not how we take care of this. We take care of this by putting it back into inventory at what it originally cost us. And so then we also have to take it out of our expense account, cost of goods sold, 250 Because what is going to happen here? If these tires are good tires and a customer returns them to us, we are most likely not going to scrap them. What are we going to do? We're going to turn around and try to sell them again. And so we may discount them, but we're going to try to move them on to a customer again if they're good tires. And so when that happens, okay, when we sell it the second time, we need to record the expense for that sale. If we don't remove the expense from this sale okay, by crediting cost of goods sold, then we will effectively have expensed it two times which does not work in accounting. We cannot expense the same asset twice. Okay, that doesn't work. So we have to make this entry. Now, like we noted above, okay, this, maybe I should change it to be the same kind of color just for the sake of consistency. But this set of entries here, these two entries we make, Okay, is what is called a sales return. Okay, a sales return. Now, that's different from a purchase return, right? A sales return is when we receive something back that we have sold, right? We sold it to our customer, and then they are then returning it to us. 
a purchase return is when we have purchased something and then are turning around and returning it back to the person or entity from which we bought them, right? And so this is a sales return. So you have the typical easy entries that we looked at at the beginning, okay, up here at the top, okay, the white and the blue in this first box, but they get complicated, right? Not everything is as simple as that. There are times when we have uh, returns that come to us. There are times when we return stuff and we have to know how to account for all of that. So where do we sit now? Okay, where do we sit now with regard to inventory? We had 53. Okay, we're up here. We had 53 and then we bought 15 more. And so we had, uh, sorry, we sold 15. I should get that right. Okay, we sold 15 of those. And so that brought us down to 38, okay, tires. And then five of those 15 that we sold came back to us. So we put them back into our inventory. So now we have 43 tires, okay? We're sitting at 43 tires. Now, we can figure out the cost of that 43 tires because right now, all 43 cost us $50 a piece. And so if we do that math and do the multiplication, we should be able to figure out how much the inventory T account or ledger account has as a balance. Okay, and so currently we would have $2,150 in our inventory account. The inventory T account, okay, at this point in time. Okay. So sales returns, purchase returns, okay, these are all items that we're going to face when we do merchandise business, okay, merchandise accounting. Okay, selling merchandise. Now, let's add in a couple more things here. Um, what happens when this customer, uh, let me erase this line here because I want to keep it in the box here. What happens when this customer then ends up paying us? So we haven't looked at that yet. Okay, when they end up paying us, we are going to get uh, cash, right? How much cash are we going to get? Well, they started out owing us $1,050. Then they returned $350 worth of stuff. So they now owe us 700 bucks. And they started out with accounts receivable balance of 1050 We took away 350 That means their account receivable balance is 700 And by crediting that account, it now becomes zero. Customer no longer owes us any money. So that's a cash payment uh, for our account, uh, sale on account here. But now I can include that in. Okay. But there are some other differences that we have to face. So let's say now we have uh, 43 tires, right? Let's say that we buy some more, okay? And we get a big purchase this time. We purchase uh, 100 tires. And we get a $50 rate on each tire. So we've now purchased $5,000 worth of tires. And let's say we haven't paid for them yet. So what do we do? We are going to debit our inventory for 5000 and we are going to credit accounts payable for 5000 We owe this money. Now, many merchandising businesses will sell to customers on account like this. 
okay? And they will send them a bill along with the products that they ship to them. In addition, many merchandising businesses give credit terms or what sometimes are called sales terms, which can be a little confusing to look at the first time, but we'll unpackage this. So, many times companies will give their customers discounts if they pay early, okay, if they pay quickly. And so sometimes you'll find sale terms or credit terms that look like this. Now, what does this mean? This means that if a company pays uh, within 10 days, they will get a 2% discount. Meaning, they don't have to pay the entire bill. And they only have to pay 98% of the bill. Now, anything they don't pay within those 30 days, the net amount remaining, okay, the net remaining amount has to be paid off within 30 days. Okay? So, in our scenario here, let's say we purchase these 5,000 dollars worth of tires and the supplier the company we purchased them from gives us these terms if I pay within the 10 days what does that look like I am going to get rid of when I make the payment all five thousand dollars of my payable I no longer owe any money to the cus to the supplier when I make this payment. But I am not going to pay all $5,000 because I get a 2% discount. And a 2% discount is $100 on a $5,000 bill. So that means when I go to write the check Okay, or send the payment, I'm only going to send my supplier 4900 bucks because I can take off the $100 for paying within 10 days. Now, am I finished with this journal entry? The answer is no. I hope we see that because it does not balance, right? We have a debit of 5000 and a credit of 4900 so to make this balance, we have to credit another account for $100. Now what do we do? Well, the account we're going to credit is inventory. Okay? Inventory. Now why do we do that? Well, assets, and this goes back to kind of the first couple of chapters. Assets... Uh, are to be recorded at their original or sometimes what we call historical cost. Okay? So assets are to be recorded at their original or historical cost, meaning what they actually cost the company. So right now, our inventory is listed at five thousand dollars for these hundred tires but since we only paid forty nine hundred for those tires the actual original cost for these hundred tires is forty nine hundred it's not five thousand and so by subtracting the hundred from our inventory right we have a debit of five thousand in our inventory and a credit of a hundred which results in a debit of forty nine hundred which is what it actually costs us and so that is why we debit or sorry credit inventory in this case now this scenario okay this here this hundred dollar discount that is what we call if I can spell again that is what we call a purchase discount because we are receiving a discount on something we purchased. OK, 
okay? So that's another kink, right? That gets thrown into this whole merchandising process. Not only can customers return stuff, not only can we return stuff, but we may also be given terms that allow us to achieve or uh, experience some discounts on the stuff that we purchased. Now, if that's true, the opposite is true as well, right? So let's take a look at what it would appear, okay, how it would look with regard to sales. So when it comes time to sell, let's say that of that 100 that we purchased, we are going to sell 80 of them, okay? And we're gonna sell them for $70 a piece, which is $5,600, okay? And our customer has not paid us yet, so we're going to debit accounts receivable for 5,600 because the amount my customers owe me is increasing. I get to record sales revenue for 5,600 because I have earned $5,600 in sales revenue. But once again, we are losing our inventory, which cost us $50 a piece, which is a total of 4,000. So what do I do? I'm going to credit the inventory account because the amount that my inventory cost me, right, my inventory level is dropping, and I'm going to expense that cost through cost of goods sold. That is how I would record a merchandise sale on account. Okay, it's never going to change. Scenarios change, the numbers change, but this accounting is not going to change. So what happens then? What if I give my customers those terms? What if I give them the 210 net 30? I do this because I don't want to wait 30 days to get paid. I would rather get 98% of the amount they owe me within 10 days than 100% within 30 because I'm waiting an extra 20 days to get 2% of the bill. Not real great when I might need cash right away or I might just want to have the money sooner so I can do something with it. So if I give my customers these terms, what happens when they turn around and pay? When I get paid, I'm going to get cash, but I'm not going to get the full amount. Since they are paying in time within the window okay i have to figure out how much of a discount they are going to get so i'm going to take uh, my two percent times the amount that they owe me which is 5600 right if i take two percent times 5600 the amount that these customers owe me, I'm going to find out how much of a discount I'm going to be giving them. And I'm going to be giving them a $112 discount. So if they pay me within the 10 days, I will receive in the mail, instead of $5,600, I will receive $5,488. Now it could be electronic payment. That stuff doesn't really matter here but I'm going to get $5,488. My account receivable, the amount my customers owe me as a result of this, goes away, $5,600, because they don't owe me anything anymore. Once they make that payment, even within the discount window, they're done. So my account receivable needs to go away. But again, as we see here with these debits and credits, this does not balance. We need a $112 debit to balance this out. Since I'm not going to be receiving this $112 from the stuff that I sold, okay, because I'm giving them a discount, I'm going to take this out of my sales revenue account because my sales revenue account really should ideally represent the amount I expect to collect from my customers. Okay, or the amount I've already collected. Okay, so this 
is like the one before with purchasing. This is what we refer to as a sales discount. Okay, a sales discount. Maybe I should not do that in blue because then it blends in with everything else. So I will do that in uh, yellow here. That is what we call a sales discount. Because we are recognizing this discount on something we sold, right? So by the end of this, okay, by the end of all these transactions, whether they're regular purchases, purchases on account, you might have purchase returns, and then you have sales, you could have sales returns. At the end of the day, once we've recorded everything, what does this look like? So I'm going to stick with our tire example here and just write down some of the facts. So we have a total of sales revenue. Okay, and let me mark this off some. We have a total of sales revenue uh, in the amount of $6,888. So if you went back through these entries and counted up the different amounts of sales revenue by either adding them together if they need to be added or subtracting them if they need to be subtracted, we would find in our T account, right, in our ledger, that the sales revenue amount is 6888 We also know that the, the cost of the goods that we sold by, again, taking debits and credits, adding them up, subtracting them, we find that the cost of goods sold is $5,000. Okay. So we've sold stuff, and that stuff we've had to purchase. It's cost us money. Where do we go from here? Okay. Once we've recorded all the transactions for the month and recorded all the adjustments that have to be made, then we can move on to the financial statements, right? And so the big change here in Chapter 6 is that we are going to move on and talk about what's called the multi-step income statement. Sometimes it's called the multiple-step income statement, but that's what we're going to look at next. Okay. Now, in this next example, some of the things I've had to make up, but I think it will be helpful to walk through. So when we build a multi-step income statement, it has three sections. It has the operating section, okay. it has the non-operating section, it has the income tax section. Now, there are actually also more sections that we do not study in this class, okay, but I'm going to put them in here just so you hear about them, okay? We have a section that we refer to as discontinued operations, okay? We have a section called non-controlling interest. And then we have a section called earnings per share, or what we usually refer to as EPS. So that's really the income statement, multi-step with merchandising businesses. But again, in our course, okay, we are really only looking at these first three. So how does this work? The first thing we're going to do on an income statement, like all our other income statements, is to put up our revenue. So we have sales revenue of 6,888. Okay. Next, we say, all right, well, we sold stuff for $6,888. How much does the stuff, how much did the stuff that we sold for $6,888 cost us? What is the cost of the goods that we sold? So what account do we need next? 
cost of goods sold. If the cost of goods sold was 5000 and we sold the stuff that cost us 5000 for 6888 that difference is what we call gross profit. Now, it's not gross because it's uh, icky and nasty, smelly, stinky, whatever. It's not gross in that respect. In accounting, gross means before stuff's taken out. Net is the opposite. Net means after stuff's taken out. So here we have gross profit. This means that the company selling these tires sold tires for $1,888 more than it cost them. Therefore, they've earned a profit of $1,888. So that's the beginning of a multi-step income statement. From there, we subtract our operating expenses. And so I'm just going to, to have a one line here for operating expenses, and I'm going to say they're 300 bucks. Okay. Operating expenses, what are these things? Well, and we could list them all individually, but for the sake of time, let's just put some over here. Operating expenses are almost every expense that we've talked about. You could have salaries expense. Right? You can have supplies expense. Uh, you can have uh, depreciation expense. You can have utilities expense. Uh, and there's more. Okay, These are operating expenses. So I've just put them all in one line here for 300 bucks now we could break them out each individually put them on here that'd be perfectly fine trying to simplify things a little bit i'm just going to include one line for operating expenses now once i subtract those operating expenses from my gross profit i get 1588 dollars and that number is what we call income from operations Okay, income from operations, meaning that by operating my business, I have earned a profit of $1,588. This particular line item does not show up on the kinds of income statements we've been building up to this point. It does not show up on the single step income statement, only on the multi step income statement. But it's a very important figure to to see, to know, if a business cannot turn a profit from its operations, well, then we have potentially a significant problem. So that all that stuff that we just put up there, okay, that is section one, okay? So I'm going to highlight this here. We're just going to put section one, section number one. That is your operating section. Multi-step income statement means there are multiple steps we have to do to put this together, right? That's generally what they're saying. That's the first section. Second section is for any other revenues and expenses. Okay, anything that's not part of our operations. Now, for most of the course of this class, we only truly are going to have one or two things down here and they gen tend to relate to interest so I'm going to put interest expense here and we're going to say that we have interest expense of 50 bucks okay so we have incurred a $50 cost related to borrowing money so we have interest expense that's not part of our operations that's part of our financing structure right we borrowed money and so once we take out those other revenues and expenses particularly interest in this case then we have a subtotal called income before tax so how much profit have we earned 
before we consider taxes. Well, in that case, if we subtract the interest expense, we would get $1,538. That would be our income before taxes. Profit before tax is taken out. And that is section number two. Okay, Once we've included the other revenues and expenses, we have completed section number two, the non-operating section. And then finally, once we have identified our income before tax, then we can identify our income tax expense. And so I'm just going to say here for the sake of illustration that our income tax expense rate is 30%. And so what do we do? How do I find my income tax expense? Well, my tax is going to be assessed on my income before tax. And so I would take the 1538, the $1,538, and multiply it times my tax rate of uh, 30%, and I should get an amount for income tax expense, $461 if I round it off. That is section number three, okay? Section number three is income tax. It's a separate section all by itself. Once I've calculated my income tax, then I can find my net income. And in my case here, 1538 in income before tax, 461 in tax, I have $1,077 in net income. So this is what we refer to as the multi-step income statement. It has multiple steps to it, but it provides much more useful information to the person reading the statement. So most businesses follow this structure. Once you've completed your multi-step income statement, okay, then you move on to your retained earnings statement and your balance sheet. Okay, those aren't going to be really affected too much by chapter six. The income statement is going to change quite dramatically, but the other statements will remain basically the same as in previous chapters. So merchandising operations, multi-step income statement, uh, these topics okay, are pretty challenging for introductory students until they get the hang of it by putting in some time to study and digest it. Okay. So as you go through and do your work, reach out, ask questions, and we can hopefully get through this together.